The Roman Empire became powerful by destroying thousands of other civilizations. They managed to build a massive military that very few could contend with at the time. But during their reign, a modest number of brave men and women sprang up to challenge them. And some of these challengers were very formidable. In this video, we will examine nine powerful enemies of ancient Rome. You will also discover that these haters of Rome were nothing to sneeze at. They inflicted considerable damage on Rome's legendary armies. Stay tuned, this is Mind Guild. King Pyrrhus of Oparis. In 280 BC, as Rome was conquering southern Italy, the Greek city of Terrace, which is modern day Toronto, called for the aid of Pyrrhus, who was a Greek commander and the king of the city of Epirus in present day northwest Greece. Pyrrhus answered Terra's call and crossed the Adriatic Sea with his army. His military talent defeated the Romans in two battles. But in doing so, Pyrrhus paid a huge price, exhausting his military resources. By the year 275 BC, Pyrrhus understood that it was pointless to carry on the fight against an enemy with access to a seemingly inexhaustible supply of manpower. Pyrrhus finally returned home, and Rome gained control of southern Italy, and ever since the expression, quote, Pyrrhic victory, end quote, has been used to refer to a successful accomplishment that was earned at far too high a cost. Enemy number two, Hannibal of Carthage. After Carthage lost the First Punic War to the Romans, they were very determined to rebuild their empire and extract revenge. The legendary general Hannibal led this vengeance against Rome during the Second Punic War. From the Spanish city of present-day Cartagena, he marched with his army, which was famous for having many war elephants, through the Pyrenees and then crossing the Alps, sweeping away everything in his path before entering Roman territory. Winning battle after battle in Italy, his legendary military campaigns rampaged the Roman Republic for almost 20 years without ever being defeated. Thanks to his military genius, his army defeated much larger Roman armies several times but he was finally defeated by the Roman general Scipio. Hannibal returned to Carthage and went into exile in 195 BC, never being captured by the Romans. Enemy number three, Mithridates VI. Mithridates VI ruled a small but wealthy realm on the Black Sea in present-day Turkey. His father was assassinated and his own mother posed a threat to his life, so he went into exile and returned as a grown man several years later. With the support of many tribes, he reclaimed the crown and murdered many members of his own family who had plotted against him. Between roughly 115 and 95 BC, his kingdom tripled in size. Rome and Mithridates fought a cold war confronting each other indirectly through diplomacy, propaganda, and political conspiracies. In 89 BC, the Roman council Manius Aquilius went to war against Mithridates. The following year, Mithridates ordered the murder of about 80,000 Roman men, women, and children in about a dozen Asian cities. The war lasted until 63 BC when Mithridates was murdered after the betrayal of his own son. Enemy number four, Jugurtha. As king of Numidia, which is present-day North Africa, Jugurtha made many enemies as he gained the throne. In 118 BC, he decapitated one of the heirs to the crown. Another heir named Adherbal fled to Rome, begging the Roman Senate for help. Jugurtha was very good at playing the Roman system by bribing everyone he could and buying as much time as he could. He captured the city of Cirta in 112 BC, and in 109 BC, Rome sent an army led by Metellus, a fine commander who was also not corruptible and very indifferent to Jugurtha's gold. The Romans, with the aid of neighboring kings, finally defeated and captured Jugurtha after six years of war. Enemy number five, Spartacus. 
Spartacus was a Roman slave of Thracian origin who escaped from a gladiator training camp in 73 BC. He took 78 other slaves with him and profited from the inequalities of Roman society by recruiting thousands of other slaves and destitute country folks. Reports claim that Spartacus' army would attach dead bodies to stakes outside their camp and equip them with weapons to make others believe that they were more numerous than they really were. The revolt of Spartacus lasted two years before it was crushed by the Roman general Crassus. The difficulty of putting down the army of Spartacus was that many of them were trained fighters. Each of them were capable of easily killing 10 or 20 Romans during each battle. Spartacus was finally killed, but his deeds turned him into a legend. Around 5,000 of his men fled north after the defeat, and over 6,000 of them were crucified. Enemy number six, Vercingetorix. After years of war and conquer in Gaul by the general Julius Caesar, the Gallic leader Vercingetorix convinced several Gallic tribes that they either had to unite against Roman armies or they would die. In 52 BC, Vercingetorix took Cinnabon, which is present-day Orleans, where he massacred numerous Romans and seized all their provisions. Even though most Gallic tribes had joined his cause, they were still simply no match for the highly organized Roman army. But Vercingetorix managed to always fight the Romans from an advantageous position on the battlefield. If he couldn't achieve the position he de desired, his army would retreat and burn all the land, leaving nothing behind and depriving the Romans of supplies. His last stand against Rome was during the siege of Alicia. Vercingetorix came to Caesar asking for mercy, hoping to prevent more Gallic casualties. Some Gallic tribes were allowed to leave, but many soldiers were turned into slaves. Vercingetorix was kept in Rome as a prisoner for six years and was finally put to death. Enemy number seven, Bodica. Bodica was the queen of the Asini, which was an eastern Britannic tribe. When the king died, the Romans tried to seize the kingdom, and the Asini joined their queen and triggered a rebellion. Some neighboring tribes joined them, and together they launched an attack against the city of Colchester, where many Romans were massacred. From there, they marched to London, the heart of the Roman commerce in Britain, and burned it to the ground. Boticus' rebellion was ended by the Roman general Suetonius in the Battle of Watling Street. Suetonius engaged the rebel force in a narrow field, neutralizing Boticus' numerical advantage. Boticus retired to her homeland where she drank poison. Enemy number eight, Shapur I. Shapur I was a Sassanid ruler determined to regain the territories that his Persian ancestors had lost, most of which were under Roman control. Shapur captured Syria and its capital Antioch, which was one of the greatest cities controlled by Rome. The Romans struck back and recaptured some of the lost territories, but they left other battlefronts open. Roman Emperor Valerian offered terms to Shapur in person along with his senior officers. Shapur took them all captive and Sasanian sources claim that Valerian was used as a human mounting block for Shapur to ascend to his horse and then he was killed. His skin was filled with straw and displayed as a trophy. Both sides were closely matched and the result of Shapur's war against Rome was inconclusive. Shapur later died of illness around 270 AD before Rome could avenge the Emperor Valerian. Enemy number nine, Attila the Hun. When Attila became the ruler of the Hunnic people, he doubled the tribute that Rome paid to Huns and imposed several additional conditions that looked more like extortion than a deal. In the year 447, Attila invaded parts of the Eastern Empire. Rome bribed one of Attila's lieutenants to murder his master, but the plot failed and upset Attila, who would never forgive nor forget. Attila invaded several cities in the western half of the empire. The Romans later engaged Attila in the Battle of Catalonian Plains in the year 451. Both sides were closely matched. 
Attila and his force left and marched toward Rome. Attila's anticlimactic end came two years later when he was found dead, choked in his own blood after celebrating his wedding. If you learned something new from my video, then subscribe to my channel right now. Let me know which of these nine enemies of Rome you found most compelling and interesting. Leave a comment with your thoughts below.